Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to all of you. Namaste. Assalamu alaikum. This is the 58th edition. That's 5 8. 58th edition of our Zoom public meeting. Thank you. For the past 57 weeks, we have not skipped a single Sunday. In the past year and nine weeks, we have featured 171 speakers from all parts of the world. Thanks to all those who have contributed in one way or the other towards the success of this Pan-Indo-Caribbean project. Ladies and gentlemen, our chairperson tonight is again Janine Gilhari from Belize. She is a young businesswoman who has started her own fashion brand called House of Gilhari. She graduated in 2019 with a bachelor's of, in fashion design and fashion business management. Ms. Gilhari held the title of Miss India Belize and represented Belize in the Miss India Worldwide Beauty Pageant in Malaysia. Ms. Gilhari, welcome and please share the meeting. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Mahavir. Good night, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, namaste, assalamu alaikum to all of you, depending on your time zone, because as you know, there's people from all over the world in these meetings. We also take this opportunity to remind everybody that the COVID-19 pandemic is still very rampant. So, you know, please take all the precautions that you can to save your life and that of your loved ones. Now, on a more positive note, we would like to join India, our ancestral homeland, in celebrating its victory at the Tokyo Olympics this year. Uh, Niraj Chopra created history by becoming the, the country's first javelin athlete to clinch a gold medal. So, you know, we're all extremely happy with that. And India also saw a new record of winning the highest number of medals in the Olympics. Now to move on with our meeting, um, as you know, this is a weekly forum. It's hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center, which is a legally registered publishing and um, research company operating since 2010. And in order to continue this program and to make it bigger and better, as with all things, we would like to ask anybody for any suggestions, opinions, and donations that you might have. Um, in order to help out, and you can contact Dr. Mahabir for those details. Now, our meeting would end at approximately 4.30 p.m. Trinidad time, or soon after, meaning it lasts about an hour and a half. Now, let me introduce to you our moderator for tonight. Once again, the always lively and exciting Ms. Bindu Jakinat Maharaj of Trinidad and Tobago, who has been an educator for the past 25 years and is also a published creative writer. So Bindu, welcome and please take over from here. Thank you very much, Janine Gilhari from Belize. Welcome everyone once again to our forum or webinar. As you, I'm seeing new faces, I'm seeing new names and I'm seeing our regulars. So for those who are new to our platform, we really do appreciate your presence here and we look forward to having you here on a regular basis. For loyalists, I would like to say thank you and your continued presence is a wonderful form of respect for our program and we really do appreciate it. So thank you. Now, before we go on to anything else, I would like to clearly establish that, you know, over the last few months, we've been having some shifting times in terms of when we do our webinar. However, based on all the different shifts and, and everything that has happened, what we've decided to do was go with a standard 3 p.m. Trinidad time, which is whatever time it is at your place right now. And this is to uh, accommodate the UK, the European and the Eastern audience as well. So we're making it workable because as Dr. Kumar said, it's a pan-Indian space, so obviously we want to have a, a wide um, catchment of viewership and contributors to our forum. So we, before we go on to our presentations and the introduction of our topic, some basics, um, please remember that you should keep your mics on mute at all times. You would see the mute button at the bottom left-hand corner. Just tap or click on it and it will mute you. 
in the event that you have to say something when we have the question and answer segment, you just unmute and you can speak. Why? Because we hear your background noises as well as we become um, privy, as I would say, to your conversations and what's happening in your personal spaces. And I'm sure you don't want this. Now, another thing, um, we have a question and answer segment that comes up at the end of all presentations. Now, in order to um, ask a question, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you would see a, a reaction button. That's the little smiley face there, right? You click on that and when you click on it, you would see raise hand. When you raise your hand, you would come up with a wait in the waiting list. So I would see the order in which the questions um, are coming. So please be mindful of that. And also, sometimes we have lovely narratives that we want to share based on what is happening. And when we, um, in the question and answer segment, what happens is that it becomes so extended with taking these narratives that um, some people do feel slighted that they don't get their chance to ask their questions. So what I would suggest to everyone those stories, those wonderful stories, those anecdotes, those reflections, go and share it on the chat. And so that we can all see it, we can have that little side discussion going on while um, everything else is going on as well. And that's it in terms of what we need to have in place before we move on to our presentations. Now, our topic tonight, tonight slash this afternoon, I always, I don't know how else to say it, so I will continue saying it like that until I find something more apt, right? Our topic tonight is a review of the first anniversary of the new PPP civic government in Guyana. The ruling people Progressive Party of Guyana marked its first anniversary or in office on Monday, 2nd August. On that historic day a year ago, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali was installed as the new president. And after five months of attempts to rig the elections and stall the declaration of the results, Dr. Ali became the ninth president of Guyana and is only 40 years old. Others who were sworn in included Mark Phillips as prime minister, Bahar Jagdeo as vice president, Anil Nandlal as attorney general, and Gail Texera as Minister of Parliamentary Affairs. Now, this Zoom public meeting would quickly review the circumstances by which the PPP came into office, its accomplishments and challenges, followed, of course, by some short recommendations for the long and the short term. Ladies and gentlemen, our very first speaker tonight is one of our own. He's, we are always here, and his name is Dr. Tara Singh. Now, Dr. Singh is a writer and researcher and former lecturer in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Guyana. He was a senior Commonwealth researcher as well as a Fulbright scholar. Dr. Singh now heads the New York Medical and Humanitarian Mission in Guyana. Welcome, Dr. Singh. I know you have a PowerPoint, so at, um, when you are ready, you can let us know when you want it to start running. Um, the screen is yours, you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, namaste, assalamu alaikum to everybody. Um, I'm gonna make a few, I, I did a PowerPoint presentation, but I will try as much as possible not to read from it, but to show it on the screen so you can follow it. And I will follow my discussion. Um, I'm not going to go into the history. I'm not going to, my main task is just work on the establishment. I'm not representing the government of Guyana. I'm not a spokesperson for the government of Guyana. This is my independent, a uh, review of the accomplishment based on original records that have seen what press releases, news conference um, information from ministries, etc. 
and collected some data from secondary source. Now I'm going to begin first by saying that the PPP embark on a very ambitious program and what they did is to get the people's involvement. So at the very beginning, they have been pushing the idea of people-oriented growth. And that's talk a bit with people. Now the masses are not accustomed to thinking of their needs in terms of abstract political theory or ideology. They're interested in bread and butter issue. And the PP realized that probably recently, and now they're addressing people pocketbook, so to speak, or lunch table. So I'm going to briefly, um, and most of the approach or philosophy to government is guided by their idea of one Guyana. One Guyana means that all development, it, according to my understanding, goes to everybody. Everybody will be included in the development advantages and benefits of, of the country. Now, they, they have done an extensive, uh, before the election, interaction with the people to collect their views and ideas. And then they formulated their covenant to the people, which is known as the manifesto. And the primary goal of that manifesto is to implement it stage by stage. So within the five years, they can achieve most of it. Now, the um, PP's approach, they realize that they have lost more than five months because prior to that, they had a no confidence motion and election supposed to take place within three months. But immediately they got into power on the 2nd of August, 2020, they were able to prepare a national budget within 29 days. That is breathtaking. And secondly, they followed up government, they took government to the people. They are taking government to the people. That has never happened before in Guyana. So we got to um, thank about that. They have also pledged for transparency and accountability. Um, that is something that people may have issues about, but at least that is their commitment and pledge. And to illustrate their idea of um, accountability and fiscal prudence, like at the end of June, they were able to save at the National Bank, the deposit account had a balance of 68.4 billion. Now you compare that to the PNC in the first year, they had a negative balance of $3 billion. So they have started out on the right track. Now I'm going to indicate a few um, or provide a few economic indicators to tell people, especially those not familiar with Ghana, about the country. Now the, the budget was 330 billion for 2020, 2021 was $303.1 billion. Now the growth rate for Guyana was phenomenal. In 2020, it was 26.2%, but most of this growth was caused by performance in the oil sector. The agriculture, it's the rest of the sector only accounted for 4.9%. So um, we mustn't get carried away with that too easily. In, in, in 2019, before oil started to play a role, it was just 5.4%. And in 2021, it's projected to be a little higher, a little lower, 21%, and in 2022, 20, 26%. Now, the per capita growth is also very important. In 2019, the per capita growth was $5,252. In 2020, it rose by 39% to 7,327. Then again, most of this could be illusory. They're taking our revenues into consideration there. So we got to be very careful. But despite that, our per capita is still less than half of, of Trinidad. But one of the things that Trinidadians got to pay careful attention to, their per capita income is declining. Between 2009 and 2020, it declined by 7.5%. 
in terms of the economy of Guyana, it's about in 2020, it was $6.8 billion. In 2021, it's likely to grow further to $8.3 billion. And according to the IMF, it will reach $14.1 billion in 2025. Now, there are several economic relief programs that the government instituted. Most people know about them. I will just briefly talk about some, um, like the COVID grant, which they delivered 25,000 to each family. The um, old age pension was increased from 20,000 to 25,200, that's by 22% over the last two years. And that will benefit 60,000 persons at a total cost of $4 billion. The public assistance rose from 9,000 to 12,000, which is a 3% increase. That will benefit another 13,000 persons and put 500 million into circulation. It also increased regular pensions from 32,000 to 25,000, which is a 9.3% increase. Uh, for the COVID, the government disbursed $9 billion nationally to 210,000 households, with each receiving $25,000. In addition to that, frontline workers got $150 million. Now, then came the devastating floods. Um, but apart from that, I just got, need to mention quickly that the government introduced some measures to re reverse taxes and to reduce some of the rates, including fees. Let me just give you a quick example, like the MME project, where farmers were renting or leasing land. The lease per acre was 3,000 per acre when PP was in power. When the PNC got in power, they increased it by 500% to $15,000 per acre. The PP cut out to reverse it back to the 3,000. There was also, corporate tax on private hospitals and private education, 25%. PP removed that completely. And they also gave incentives to construct hospital, agri-processing, food storage packaging, et cetera. The Amerindian Development Fund was revived. And my last check, they got 1.7 billion Guyana dollars in it. They have restored the 1,972 CSOs, those are Amerindian community workers who were all fired by the PNC in 2015. And plus the government is also providing them with vehicles and uh, tractors recently. Now, all, everyone knows about the reopening of the three sugar estates. Um, Rose Hall will be open shortly. They have started recruitment. And so far, they have, um, Gaisuko has rehired 1,200 workers with more to come. Um, I, I want to mention too that when governments spend this money, it's, they have a philosophy behind this. They are combining investment with consumption. You see, the economy was very sluggish, so they had to inject a lot of liquidity into the system to cause to spur economic growth. And then you will have investment, et cetera. And that's why they give incentives to people to invest in factories, hotels, et cetera, and the consumers to get more money in pockets so they can spend and stimulate for the growth. Um, I, I, a very nagging problem in Guyana, and I get several calls about it, people complain that they're entitled to NIS, national insurance, but they never get, although they reach a qualifying limit. The new Minister of Finance, Dr. Ashton Singh, took this matter to the people. They went into several communities. There was a backlog of 14,000 cases, and less than a year, they were able to reduce that by 11,000. So they only have 3,000 cases remaining. And also there were 3,000 cases pending which they were able to resolve. So that was a big, big move and great credit to the PP government for having done that. Now, in terms of education, education, 
and health. Those are two vital sectors which the government believe those two areas are necessary for economic prosperity in Ghana. The two combined is actually command 30% of the total budget in Guyana, which is $14.2 billion. Now, the, the Harvard Education Sector Improvement Project Plan was never in place during the PNC. Uh, when PP got into power in 1992, they had this plan. They had it before Ramitar left, but after the PNC took power, they got rid of the plan. Now the ministry has reworked this plan with a grant from the World Bank. And um, that is going to be according to the minister that will be implemented shortly. They finished the draft and they are going to share it um, after some final refinement. Now the World Bank also gave them a 7 million US for nursery and primary education to enhance that. Now, I just want to tell you that people often criticize the, the education system in Ghana, but education in Ghana is still ranked the third in the Caribbean, only after Cuba and Barbados, and second in South America, only after Argentina. So people got to realize that in as much as COVID will affect economic performance uh, to a large extent, but generally, if you take that out, Ghana is doing well at the educational level, but there's room for much, much more improvement. Now, to, we talk about the grants where they get. Now, the government embark on this, this again. Whatever the PEP does is very consistent with the covenant that they made with the people. They are going to fulfill that manifesto. They promise to double the grants, the students, they were getting 2,000, 4,000 for the uniform supplies, and they also introduced a new grant, um, 15,000 grants for, they can use whatever we like to enhance the children's education. So each child get 19,000 as part of that grant. So if you have three children, you get $57,000. And that again will help a lot of poor people in Ghana. Um, it's commonly assumed because when people go in Georgetown, they see big buildings and fancy houses up East Coast, and you get the impression that all is well in Ghana. But let me tell you this, Ghana has a poverty rate of 36%. In 1972, the poverty rate was 36% then. It hasn't changed significantly over the years, just a few points. So people always got to bear in mind. So the people of Ghana really need that help to educate their children. And um, apart from that, as you know, the government introduced 20,000 scholarship. They have allocated $1.1 billion initially for that. The first year they're having between four to 6,000 of those scholarships in all fields. And that is being managed both jointly by the Ministry of Education and Public Service Ministry. And they're in the process also establishing four schools, three schools. Now the health sector is very important. You know, they have come in for some criticism because of the COVID. They were allocated 5.53.5 billion in 2021. And you know, they get vaccine from Russia, the Sputnik 5, the AstraZeneca, they got recently about 84,500 from the UK and they got Sinopharm from China. They were trying to get the Pfizer, Johnson, and Moderna, but they said they got to wait till 2022. The government couldn't wait. The good news is all regional hospitals now in Guyana have ventilators and monitors. And PCR tests is done in the national lab. It was done at Lethem, Mabaroom, and New Amsterdam, and Linden, plus at private facilities. The antigen tests can be done in all regions at all the hospitals. Now, Dr. Anthony, the minister, provided me some figures up to last week. They said 51.3% of the adult population had a first dose and 28% had a second dose. And the COVID hospital at Ocean View on the east coast of Demara is fitted with 200 beds with 45 ICUs. Now, they are refurbishing the Diamond, Lenora, Mabaruma, Latham hospitals, and the Paramakatai Health Center is making these climate resilient. That's another important development. And design works have started in the West Damara Hospital, 
the Saudi hospital is Bartik as well. And they are constructing our diabetic center. Now rehabilitation in New Amsterdam, Port Moran, Mibicure and Skelton hospitals are in progress and works are going on in 50 health centers throughout the country. Now this, the ministry has a strategic plan. It's already been done. And the minister said shortly they will release it to the public. They're also doing a plan for HIV, which is called HIV Vision 2021 to 2025. And they have malaria gui um, guidelines, they have policies on neglected disease, policies on rehabilitation services, et cetera. I'm going to move on. Um, now, road construction. A lot of people are interested in and The government is spending $26.5 billion on roads. Um, 1.9 billion of that goes towards hinterland uh, road project. To date, over 40 roads have been rehabilitated, especially the feeder roads and service roads in the country areas and some in Georgetown. Um, now they, they're working also on the 125 kilometers road from Linden to Mabura. The sign of the contract will be anytime during this quarter, 3.2 billion has was allocated for that. Now that is very important for the logging and mining industries and to open up the interior. Um, the East Coast Road link to Ogre and which was initially old to Diamond Oak, but now you change from Ogre to Eccles. There's a 50 million US project financed by the government of India. And that the contract is expected to be signed in this quarter. And that will take a lot of pressure off the traffic going to Dodge Um, Here at the top of this picture, you'll see um, the Minister of um, Public Works and the former minister of Cotton Ribbon to a road in Industries, Coast of Marar, that just opened yesterday. Now, um, the Sheriff Street to Mandela Avenue, which is a big, big eyesore, that has been going on for years since the PP left office. The PNC never completed that, but so far the PP has completed 70% of that, and they're expected to finish it by October. Uh, the governments are doing other roads in other countries, like uh, other areas in the country, like Skunarto, Parika, the Kanji Creek Access Road, the Bar Ticket, the Sun the Diamond, to Timory. If you can look at the picture at the side, there's an artist's impression of the Mandela, the Sheriff Street Mandela um, Road, how it looks like when it's finished. Um, see, defense is another major thing. When the PP took power, they had a major problem at Sea Bridge in Danzig, Maikoni area, Mahika Maikoni area. The, the whole area had mangrove trees, about 7,000, but those were destroyed and the exposure to the sea made it this. If you can look at the picture, it was very vulnerable. They had to bring in rocks and stone to, to, to seal that breach. It took them months, but they managed to get it done. Now that attests the fact that Ghana is below the sea level and they will continue to have challenges like this. And that is something that the government has to pay close attention. I think Ravi might talk about that. Now, I just mentioned with Timory Airport, you know, that was going on again. Um, they are getting it. Um, that should be finished, hopefully, by year end. And that will be a state of the art airport, which could be an important transshipment point. Now, bridges, the two major bridges they're talking about the new Demarara Harbor Bridge and the Suriname to um, Guyana to the Quarantine Bridge. There's a picture on the left where the Ghana team and the Surinamese team are at the site where the bridge will actually end in the Guyana side. And below is the old Demarara Harbor Bridge. Um, and they're going to do um, also, or I'm talking about sea defense, the government has allocated, uh, let me see, um, $5.2 billion for sea defense work which is hoped to cover about 5,615 meters. Um, let me move on. I, I can't, 
Now, agriculture. Saying, so let me just interrupt. So you have about two minutes again, right? Okay. So okay. Just you... The agriculture sector, um, they are working on diversification, revival of the sugar industry. Um, we talk about the opening of the new varieties of crops, et cetera, and um, they are mechanizing um, sugar. One good thing is that sugar is showing some sign of life now. They are able to pay back over 900 million in debt in the last six months, which is a um, commendable. The agriculture sector is allocated to 2.6 billion, the largest in the history of Guyana. Um, now, um, I, I have to skip some of these things. Um, but the, an important thing in agriculture is the promotion of soya and corn. 500 million Guyana dollars will be invested in that project and new markets for rice in Hungary and Latvia. Um, let me see, housing. Now, while this, the signature projects of the PP is housing, when um, the PP took power, 67,849 applications, there was a backlog. The PNC only completed 7,373, an average of 1474 per year. The number of house lots the PP allocated this year alone is 5,926, which is four times what the PNC. And the plan and the PP also gave out 1,200 titles already. Now, um, I'm not going to go into other things. Uh, but the PP has different categories of housing, low income, professional, poor homes, is distributed throughout the country, and, and also artisan wells, which is a major concern. They were able to dig 12 new wells throughout all the regions in Guyana, uh, where over 3,500 people can benefit. Plus, they estimate about 20% more of the hinterland community they have to dig wells, and that will complete what they are doing there. Um, now, they are also combining, oh, okay, I, I have to skip that, um, I, I can, uh, housing. Okay, labor um, have increased the um, labor officers to enforce the labor laws, et cetera. And um, they set up special, um, place where we can apply for jobs, et cetera, that was never done before. And they have the national training program in conjunction with embassies in Guyana. Now, this law reform is very, very important. This is a container which got all amenities, Wi-Fi, et cetera, where they, they will try people now virtually. So if they're in prison, uh, uh, Lusitan, they have this installed now with all the equipment, you have the lawyers could be there and the judges can be in their chambers and try cases. That's a remarkable achievement. Um, it was funded by IDB at $1.1 billion. Um, now, Mr. Nanalal is also working on a law reform committee that he just appointed. Then he's looking at reform of the election process. Now, constitutional reform, is not a priority at this point because they got many more things. Plus, he's working on land titling with the Minister of Agriculture of Cotton Free East Coast Human Services. Again, they get one point or one billion dollars for the European Union to work primarily among gender violence, women, and to set up entrepreneurship among women, etc. I haven't seen they done anything in terms of suicide prevention or alcoholism yet. Maybe I haven't got the data, but now, a very sore question, I, I just, just give me one more minute. Public security is a very sore issue in Guyana. Now, the official records are saying crime, serious crime is down, but the public perception and the press are reporting that crime is up. I don't know what is true, but what is important in crime is the impact is high. Only last or during this week, a gold miner was robbed of over um, $58 million and the people were caught yesterday. There were two GDF guys 
at West Coast, um, someplace, um, Virginia and West Coast. Now that is a well orchestrated um, plan. Okay. Also, one guy needs to return to Guyana and he was killed. Now when, and, and then two people working in the same man gold mine was found murdered. When that happened, the magnitude of the crime problem expand to such a way you can't convince that crime is not increasing. And they have to deal with it. Um, they, they got both short term and long term, which um, we can address, but I can't. Okay. I just have the final, just give me if it is final. Now there are a couple of ministers here. You have Pauline Sakai, and Sonia Parag, Lou Todd, and Charles Ramson. They're doing a terrific job as well. And not because I was able to comment on them because of the time factor. And um, the, the, just finally, the embassy now is being restructured to cater for more trade, investment, and diaspora engagement. That is very important. And um, Sonia Parag is doing a fantastic work in managing these gold GOAL scholarships. And also she's reorganizing the civil service, which is outdated. So we want to come in all the ministers, the government. And thank, and thank you, I'm sorry oh. I went. <laughs> no. Okay, no problem, Dr. Singh. Um, so you've given us um, information that is seems to be bent, um, projected to us using statistics, using data and so on. And um, one of the things that's coming up on the chat, and I'll bring this up afterwards, so just I'll keep this in mind, um, is are these figures that you're showing us, are they um, projection included or are they the, possibly the implemented thing? So we'll talk about it after during the mm -hmm. question okay. and answer segment, right? So okay. thank you. So our second speaker this afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon and tonight, is Mr. Ravidev. Now, Mr. Ravidev is also a familiar person <clears throat> to this platform, and he has been a contributor in terms of raising really salient issues and so on and points when we have our discussions. So let me tell you a bit about Mr. Ravidev. Mr. Ravidev is an Indian civil rights activist and former member of parliament in Guyana. He is also a former attorney at law in New York City. And he was the leader of RAW, Rise, Organize, and Rally. Now, RAW was formed in response to a massive violence against Indians in Guyana after the 1997 elections, which the PPP won. Welcome, Mr. Day. So you have 15 minutes. I'll be interrupting you around 12 minutes to remind you that you just have about three minutes, okay? So welcome, and the screen is yours. Well, thank you, Bindu. Um, namaskar, assalamu alaikum. Peace, grace, and hope, as the Apostle Paul said. My, I was asked to speak about the challenges to the PPP government, which has now been just over a year in government. As Dr. Tarasing uh, explained in great detail, uh, a lot of things have been done, have been unfurled, and he might be able to tell us more as to how many of them have actually been completed. But I want to put all of this into perspective, talk about the challenges, because a rather famous analyst once said that men make their own history, it is true, but they make it not in circumstances that they may choose. You have to work within the circumstances in which you find yourself. So the PPP, we have to look for, for judging its accomplishments and as to where it will head, or how, what will be the outcome. Uh, we have to look at the circumstances in which it is operating. And in this case, we're looking at the political equation. So I will focus on that. As Stara explained, we have gone through at least four governmental changes 
since 1992. And we have seen that the PPP came into office in that year, 1992, after 28 years of rigged elections. And the question we have to ask is, why was the PNC allowed to get away with those rigged elections to have what was then a completely illegitimate government? And the PNC, which again came back into office in 2015, at the end of that term, again, attempted to rig that election barefacedly in front of the entire world. It failed, but the PPP is now being forced to live with the consequences of that rigging. Because you see, I am in Guyana. I think I'm the only person on this panel, or I, I don't know how many we have from Guyana in the audience even, but I am in Guyana. I live in Guyana, I'm here. And I'll tell you what, that the PNC has not given up its determination to remove and keep the PPP out of office. In 1998, when you alluded to those beatings that were unleashed in the streets of Georgetown against Indians, Mr. Trotman, who was then in the PNC, Raphael Trotman, he had a term, he said, the, the duty of the opposition is to oppose, expose, and depose the government. And this is what we saw on furl after 1998, where between 1998 and 2008, in that decade, hundreds of people were murdered, Indian villages were were uh, invaded with impunity, very similar to what we are seeing going on in um, South Africa right now. Only last week, the EFF marched into Phoenix, the Indian township there, with impunity, with impunity, uh, and uh, made all kinds of threats against the people there. Houses were stoned. So, what I want to say is that what is playing out in Guyana is not unique to Guyana. So I will not get as granular as Tara in terms of the actual statistics. I want to paint the, 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 the portrait a little broader. So people in Trinidad, in South Africa, in Fiji, and in other places where we Gilmitia were settled may see some parallels because they are parallels for the simple reason that the systemic condition underlying our, our arrival into these countries and our existence in these countries is being questioned and being threatened. I raise then the question of legitimacy, that the PPP government was never seen as legitimate by the PNC and its supporters, and I dare say by the leaders of the Caribbean going all the way back to the beginning of our politics in the 1950s. They all claimed and they said that Jagan's point was to form an Indian state in Guyana, and that of course just couldn't be. No one picked up on the irony that the Caribbean was defined as part of the Pan-African nation, and, and that was okay. I want to say that what the PNC is, the PPP is confronting today is that same underlying deep denial of legitimacy because its support base by and large come from the Indian community. So the PPP's dilemma that no matter how, uh, how would I put it, how facially neutral their policies might be, it will always be, be judged from an ethnic perspective. And as they say, give a dog a bad name, then hang it. And that is what is playing out in Guyana today. 
But we, it's, it's nothing new. Between 1992 and 1997, under very strained circumstances, we were one of the most indebted nation in the world in 1992. But by 1997, Barajagdeo and others had worked to remove that debt and our household income expenditure surveys showed that we had reduced poverty from 43% to 36%. And urban poverty, which is a, syn a synonym for African Guyanese, went down even lower. The point is that the PPP did not discriminate in its policies, yet riots broke out and dozens of Indians were killed, hundreds of buildings were burnt, and we were left traumatized with my marauding guns. So we have to look at Dr. Singh's figures, not with skepticism, but to ask the question as to what point will it be? Let us look as to what is going on in Guyana right now in terms of this legitimacy. Right now, the PNC has declared it will not say that the PPP is a legitimate government. Why? Because of some concocted figures on the, on the voting, which was refuted by a recount certified by the CARICOM nations and all of the observers from all the major groupings in the world yet they continue to say the PPP is illegitimate. Not only that, because these nations simply stole their truth, PPP is now dubbed to be an installed regime, that they were installed by the West. Never mind that the Commonwealth went ahead with it, the CARICOM groups went ahead with it, all the groups that came into Guyana okayed it, yet the West is now said to be, have installed the PPP. In fact, the, the CARICOM nations, having given Burnham a free pass for 28 years, are now being cast out. And when in St. Vincent, Doc, uh, uh, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez was hit by a rock by one of his citizens when they were protesting COVID, in position, in Guyana, there was great celebration in the PNC camp. And they said, this is the way to go. Knock them with bricks and do the same in Guyana. Openly, this was said. That's the same you must do. So take all those programs that Tara elaborated on, some may say with excruciating detail. Each of those programs, the PNC have delegitimized them to its own supporters, who we must remember is just about 17,000 less than what the PVP has, have delegitimized them by claiming racism. So talk about the flood relief that was handed. Well, they're saying, well, you skipped whole black villages. Don't throw any facts out, but that's it. But our black villages didn't get. Also, when you did give out a black family, you threw it in front of their yard. You didn't give them any dignity to hand them. You had to uh, make them bend up and pick it up. That petty they are. Look at the COVAX vaccine, where this government moved mountains because the developed nations had hogged vaccine supply. Other countries couldn't get them. They went every which way and secured vaccine. And now, the opposition is telling its supporters that this is simply a ruse to give vaccine to wipe out their constituency. It is also a human rights violation. The government hasn't made it mandatory. It has just said that to, to access certain services, you must be vaccinated. But yet that is now seen as discriminatory as if all Guyanese wouldn't have to observe those same formats. Somehow it has been twisted 
I'm believed by that constituency that somehow African Guyanese are being discriminated against and it is playing out. So each one of those, I don't want to again go into detail, the housing, oh, that's all given to Indians. Uh, never mind that there were 400 given out at Linden. They are just saying this, and you see in a divided polity like Guyana, people hear what they want to hear. And I live in a mixed village of Eiffel on the west coast of the Marara, and that message is finding fertile ground so the PPP can continue and should continue to do what it does. But as they did between 1992 and 2015, it will be for naught because that community now is being mobilized by the PNC for protests openly. They have started mobilizing in the villages, especially the villages where they are strong in the East Coast, the villages of Buxton, are historically seen as their forerun of their villages. Today at Victoria, which was the actual first village formed by Africa, Freed Africans. And historically, they now are saying it openly that they are, they are, they are protesting at Coffee Square every Wednesday now. But once they reach the numbers they're looking for in the thousands, they will march into Georgetown and march through the commercial area of Regent Street, which again is a metaphor for Indian business. And that is the whole point we want to talk about. That we in Guyana and in all the societies we are living, we are not playing politics as what they say, valence politics or positional politics, where you vote for people based on their competence or their position on issues. No, the PNC is still playing cold, callous, ethnic politics, as Burnham did in 1955 when he split the United Nationalist Movement. And as he said, back to back, belly to belly, I don't give a damn, I don't get a ready. In our Creole colloquialism, it really means I don't give a damn. I want power and I will use whatever means to achieve that power. So coming back to so what is needed, and I'm sure Dr. Ramarap will check and test and expand on some of these. But I would like to simply say that until the Indian who was brought to these shores over hundreds of years, a hundred years ago, and chose to remain here. We celebrate Arrival Day. Arrival Day because we arrive at a new home. Those of us, two thirds of us, who chose to remain here, one third went back to India. But those of us who arrived here declared ourselves to be Guyanese, to be a Caribbean people, to be a South African people, to be a Fijian people, to be a Ugandan people. But everywhere we have not been given that legitimacy. And our very success, you know, one scholar thought that our credo was laboro ergo sum, that our thing is, is to, to labor, is to be. Our, we saw ourselves as just this compulsion to work and to create. And yet for that, we are being all over the world, being given the short end of the stick. And it's playing out today in South Africa. Read the news today in South Africa. And we'll see what I'm talking about. So to come back to it, we as a people, Gilmitias or people of Indian origin have to insist and know the battle that we are fighting. We are fighting a battle, not just for political legitimacy that the PPP will fight, but we are fighting a battle to be accepted as authentic citizens of these countries. We may practice our own, our own culture, but there's something called cultural citizenship. Each one of us has a right to practice our own culture. But as citizens of this country, we have our equal right to the patrimony of the state. But African Guyanese and their ideologues 
whether here or in South Africa. They have, for example, in Guyana here, uh, the ideologues will say, we arrived before the Indians. We were enslaved, therefore we suffered more. We were educated first. Never mind at the same time they're criticizing the, the, the education as a hegemony that has kept them in mental slavery. Yet they were educated before, you know, they entered the civil service before. And for all of these reasons, they have a greater right. And we have to reject this lock, stock and barrel in all the lands we arrived. Look at Trinidad. Right, I read to my consternation that the, the success of Indian uh, young children at age 11, taking what in Guyana was called the common entrance, right, or 11 plus in England, um, they are now being criticized for being too successful. Can you imagine that? But it shows you that there is this prior right of being more legitimate. Therefore, whatever it takes is okay. So in Guyana, coming back, um, for example, anyone can form a bank. The Bank of Guyana has a criteria as to how much capital you need, what hurdles you must jump through, and you can launch a bank. Yet African Guyanese keep on complaining that they don't have a bank and they're denied credit. Well, Yasukasad is now being criticized for forming a bank way back in 1994. Uh, but he just passed through and jumped through those hoops. Nobody's saying anyone. Mr. Dave, you have two minutes again, if you don't. Very good. So I'll close up. Okay. The greatest uh, um, challenge to democracy in Guyana by the PNC right now, and we must all be aware of this through the diaspora where we live, is that the PNC is not denying Indian personal legitimacy or the PPP's political legitimacy, but also they are denying the legitimacy of the democratic process, our democratic system in Guyana. So what these people are doing is to cut the limb that is, that is saving us from being, living that short, brutish and nasty life that Hobbes talked about, that governance had gave to us, that we now have rules. But the PPP, in ignoring these rules of democracy, would have us now go back to the law of the jungle where might is right. And they can do this, sisters and brothers, because they are counting on the armed forces in Guyana, which historically discriminated against Indian uh, from entering those forces and are now 80 to 90% skewed in them in their favor. So in their protests, you will notice they will taunt that force that you are our kit and kin, and therefore you must stand by us. So in conclusion, my last sentence will be this, that we should not argue about whether ethnicity is real or not real and all of that. There's a saying, it's called pharmacist theorem in sociology, that if men define their circumstances are real, as, as real, they are real in their consequences. And in Guyana, the PNC's definition of the circumstances in Guyana, refusing to accept that we are a nation of minorities and they can win an election if they were to court other groups apart from their own, they are neglecting that. And in that sense, we have to deal with those circumstances. I thank you. Okay. Thank you again, um, Mr. Dave. You are always so astute and precise in the information, the analysis that you're giving. And I'm glad you brought up the issue about national security because we've had some questions about that. But uh, thank you so much. And please wait on because you know that there's going to be a question and answer segment after our final presentation. And then there are some questions in the chat that I would um, I would like to relay on behalf of some of our audience members. So thank you again. And now we move on to our third and final presenter. Now, uh, our final presenter again is no stranger and he is Dr. Beturam Ramhara. Now he's originally from Guyana, but now lives in New York. He's an adjunct associate professor of political science in Nassau Community College in New York. He's the author of the biographies on Balram Singh Rai and Jong Bahadur Singh of Guyana. Welcome, Dr. Ram Harak. 
Great to have you on board our platform as a presenter. Are you there? I'm here. Can you okay, guys lovely. hear me? Yes, right. I hear um, you. The screen is yours. You have 15 minutes, right? Thank you. So let me say Namaskar, Salam Alaikum, uh, good day uh, or good evening, wherever you are, to everyone. Um, so, you know, listening to my good friend uh, Tara, um, you know, one will probably get a very Pollyannic view that everything is all well and good in Guyana. Uh, Mr. Dev points out, you know, some of the challenges, right, uh, that the PVP has to deal with. So, so in my uh, little mini presentation, I want to focus a little bit on some of the uh, possible solution in terms of how we can kind of move away, you know, from some of the problems we're seeing in Guyana, because they're, they're really not new. Uh, but in terms of, you know, grading, um, you know, the first year of the PPP in office, um, I, I think when it comes to looking at Guyanese politicians, we do have to kind of grade them on a curve, so to speak, um, because the challenges seem to be they're there, they continue, and then we discuss the challenges, and then it still remains as if they are continuous challenges. I, I think one of the central problems is how we look at the, the situation in Guyana. Uh, from the PPP's perspective, um, you know, they tend to adopt a sort of a class analysis, even though one may argue that not many folks in Guyana, uh, in a sense, hold on to that class analysis. But when, when you take that approach, you look at Guyana as a society where whatever you're doing as a government, uh, if it's an, in good deed, it means that eventually everything will trip along or trick along to everyone in society. So I think the PPP's approach uh, is that whatever is being done by the PPP will eventually trick along and every Guyanese will benefit, especially from this new um, you know, oil and gas economy that we're looking at. That's a problem because when you look at Guyana, and, and I challenge any one of you here, if you were to go to Guyana and you live there for a couple of weeks, you will feel the tension. You will see that the, the central variable around which uh, things are centered around in Guyana is this whole issue of ethnicity and race. And that's the challenge. And I think if you don't recognize that, then it's a problem. Um, now the PVP can talk about all the good things that they have done, but the reality in Guyana is that you, you are seeing all of the major organizations, opposition forces are aligned against the PPP. You're looking at, you know, when we had that five months uh, of siege, uh, trying to steal the election, every major political leaders or intellectual authors in Guyana, people who have written about Guyana have actually taken a position to remain silent or to support the government. You look at the social media today, um, you know, we have uh, David Hines, for instance, uh, who is a credible leader among Africans, uh, made the statement that we need to burn the ballot boxes, and that's the way to go. So my point is that if we don't recognize today that Guyana is a very deeply divided society, it means that any kind of uh, program we're talking about uh, and all of its, uh, you know, uh, positive effect on the population, if we don't recognize that fact, it means that we are saying that well, Guyana is a multi-ethnic society. There's really no problem. So therefore we can continue to do what we're doing. So we have to look at history, for instance, before the PPP. If we're gonna talk about this one year of PPP success, and obviously Tara Singh pointed out a lot of positive things, but we have to also look at the fact that this one year of, ex of existence is not isolated. It's not in a vacuum. We have institutional memory. We have experiences that go before that one year. And of course, it also makes sense for us to look at what is going to happen in the future. So we have spent a lot of time um, talking about, you know, how we can kind of move away, you know, from this sort of, a, you know, division and kind of promote a, a society where we can kind of all live together. So I, I know Komar insisted um, that I uh, put together PowerPoints. So I'm going to move to that because I guess it will kind of keep me um, on track. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to run through that uh, with you. All right. So, so I think, you know, if we're going to assessed in terms of you know, where we're heading beyond this one year um, of the PPP existence. I think a lot of uh, things will depend 
on, on how well President Ali understands history and the extent to which uh, he's willing to use power and influence to make the necessary changes. Now, obviously, you know, crises present opportunities. You know, you, your previous speakers talk about COVID. You know, we had a national flood in Guyana, a major flood, uh, one of the worst uh, in history. Uh, you've got other issues dealing with uh, the sugar estates and so on. So the question is, how is he going to deal with these things? And how is he going to create institutions that's going to address those issues? Now, the challenges uh, that I see, that, that I see, I'm, I'm going to list five of them very quickly here. When you look at the challenge, and again, keep in mind, as I said, this is a very divided society. The PPP has, you know, two seats ahead of the opposition, right, in terms of the, um, the APNU and, and plus uh, AFC. So it's a very narrow victory if you want to put it that way. So the challenge is how do you expand on that and how do you continue to build on that? And the question maybe we can ask ourselves here is what if uh, the PPP loses the next election? The majority of the supporters of the PPP will have to ask themselves, well, are we better off now um, or were we better off then? So, so I, I think there are five, there are five basic challenges that the PVP has to deal with. One is this whole notion of economic deprivation, right? When you look at the, you know, uh, the comments coming from well-known uh, PNC advocates, the issue is, well, what is, the, what is the benefit to the African people in Guyana? Secondly, um, you know, you're looking at a situation where every single uh, spokesperson who represents the opposition Almost every single, and that includes the people who represent the AFC, they will address the issue from an ethnic racial uh, perspective, namely that the PVP is there to represent Indians and it's not doing a very good job at incorporating and, and being very inclusive to, to include everyone else uh, in society um, so that everybody can progress uh, from A to B. Corruption is also going to be a major issue. Um, you know, whether we like it or not, uh, this has been a dominant issue. Uh, Guyana ranks very low on the uh, corruption index. Uh, so corruption is an issue. This is also um, something that the opposition will use uh, to its effect. Uh, Mr. Dev talked about the fact that the PV government is considered to be illegal. Um, and that is, that is basically the challenge, right? That they will continue. Um, so, so that language that the PVP is an illegal government, it was installed uh, by CARICOM, it was installed by the United States, the ABC countries and so on. That is going to continue because that is what holds the opposition uh, together. Uh, we can't also ignore the fact that, as I said, Guyana is a racial, racially divided country, more so today that, that in the past, you know, we've had incidents in 1992 uh, where the cards of people who came down to observe the election after 28 years uh, were held up um, in GCOM office, right? And then we had a major riot again in, in January 12, 1998, following the 1997 election, where those riots eventually led um, to the PPP having forced to cut down uh, its term of office by two years, right? So the question is, what is to be done? And I'm going to go through this very quickly, and we can talk about them after, right? Uh, we have proposed in the past a number of solutions. Now, I'm not sure if all of them will make sense to the PPP, but I do know that some of these uh, were brought to the attention of the PPP by members who are now in this audience today, and the response has been in the negative. Um, first and foremost, I would say, you have to have some level of national dialogue. Um, I don't believe that it is uh, effective for the PPP right now, which is in power, to say, well, you have to recognize, again, saying to the opposition, that you have to recognize us as the legitimate government before we can sit down and recognize you as an opposition and have dialogue in terms of how we can move the country uh, forward. If the PPP is very uh, you know, comfortable in the fact that they've, they've won the election, uh, which is what has been certified by the international community, then this ought not to be um, a problem because you are still continuing to have this division between the Africans and the Indians um, in Guyana. And as, as I said, that problem has been uh, very much escalated um, since, since the election or even before the election. We in the past have talked about something called ethnic impact statements. Basically what this means is that 
if the concern from Africans uh, is that the government represents Indians and protecting Indian interests, then why not evaluate uh, policies and who benefits from those policies? So we've called them ethnic impact statements. So if, if a policy is being adopted by the government, uh, then you can come back and evaluate those policies and see who benefits and then make the correction to make sure that the intended communities benefit why is this important? It's important because in the long run, you don't want to have opposition elements saying, look, whatever you have done in government has only benefited, benefited your own supporters. So this to me, I, I think is something uh, you know, that can be done to assess uh, policies. The third thing we've talked about, we've written about this, uh, we're talking about you know, having inclusive institutions, balancing institutions, the whole notion of having um, you know, a balanced armed force is very crucial. Uh, all of you remember, for instance, Mr. Hoyt in the opposition had called on Kit and Kin uh, in neighboring Trinidad during the Black Power movement. Um, Eric Williams, who felt threatened you know, by a predominantly African-led um, you know, rebellion, uh, so to speak, felt that it was important to also have some balance in, into that, um, you know, into that armed force. So we've we've seen the situation with GCOM, where uh, Robeson Ben um, has criticized. He was a member of, of the of GCOM. He has criticized GCOM for having uh, at least ninety percent of the workers coming from from one uh, ethnic community. Um, so, so that is something that needs to be balanced. Um, the police force, the civil service, and so on, those things ought to be, ought to reflect, you know, the population that reside in that country. Here in the United States, uh, when people talk about policing, they're really talking about, you know, having a police force that reflects uh, the community um, that police uh, force uh, serve. Uh, we have also talked about, you know, having what is called a federalized republic, uh, meaning that Guyana is divided geographically in such a way that you can really have a lot of power taken away from the central government and lodged into the hands of leaders uh, in these um, you know, smaller communities. As people with the Marara Borobis, we've also talked about maybe creating another republic, so to speak, um, you know, where Amerindians reside so they can have some kind of a, a, you know, um, control. Uh, over their lives. Now, we're not talking about dividing the country in terms of population. That's going to be impossible to do. But geographically, we want to take that uh, power center away from the, from Georgetown and our local people to have you know the ability to run uh, their own affairs. One of the criticism or one of the arguments uh, of the opposition today <coughs> is that uh, the largesse of the state only benefits their own supporters. Well, uh, the PPP has done this before. We've talked about having an affirmative action program, you know, where depressed communities, for instance, like the Amerindians, uh, can have access uh, to resources. And I think this has to be a sort of a program uh, that can address um, economically depressed communities, not just the Amerindians, uh, but Indians in, in, in the countryside, uh, Africans, Native Americans, and so on. Um, and I think lastly, um, we have to have some kind of a reshaping of, you know, how uh, we have been brought up in Guyana. I think changing the education curriculum uh, to reflect the fact that we are really our people, you know, from different backgrounds, different communities, different, different experience and so on. So the notion of one people, you know, one nation, one destiny sounds pretty good. Uh, but I think unity and diversity may be a, a better way to go. So having said that, my concluding point is that, you know, sometimes we have to look at the reality on the ground, as opposed to looking at the statistics, we have to look at the history uh, of what happened before this one year, uh, and look at, you know, possibly what can happen in the future. Um, I can tell you that in terms of uh, one major issue, which we've been writing about balancing the armed forces, which is very crucial, it has happened in the past. Um, uh, you know, we've seen people like Balram Singh Rai, who was a home affairs minister, actually try to go out and do that and try to create a balanced force. Um, my fear, uh, my fear is that the PPP will not touch this. And I think uh, this is part of the dilemma we're faced with. It's one thing to talk about, you know, what the opposition is doing. Uh, the other is looking at who we are and how do we try to fix these problems. And again, it comes back to the question, you know, that I raised 
uh, before. What if the PPP were forced to leave office today? Uh, or if you, by protest you have a, a situation where they were forced to reduce the term of office, or what if they lose uh, the next election? The question has to be asked is, how are their supporters going to be better off? So my point is, if these institutions are not in place, and if the PPP is not receptive, because sometimes we have to look at you know the reality in the ground and say, look, sometimes we are the enemies. Um, we have discussed this, I can tell you many times, uh, with people who support the government and their position is that, well, you can't address these things like this because you can't talk about them, you can't talk about the armed forces, you can't balance the police force, namely because uh, you will be called a racist. Well, if you have power and you're governing and you're concerned about you know, establishing future institutions that you're setting down to make sure there's some kind of harmony in society, then you have to really look deep within and address these issues and try to go out there and balance uh, these institutions because they are crucial uh, in terms of how uh, you know we can promote some kind of uh, you know harmony in Guyana. It's a difficult challenge, uh, but but you know if you want to look beyond the one year of the PVP rule, uh, there is still hope uh, that they can actually do some of this uh, to make sure that uh, Indians will not face a situation they've they have faced with, for instance, in Fiji, you know, where there was a military coup uh, in the 1980s. Uh, we have the situation in South Africa. So, so th there are really many opportunities here for this government if they have the stamina. Um, you know, if they have the determination and if they're willing to do it to make sure that their own supporters, uh, as well as others in Guyanese society, uh, will, will live in a society where we can all benefit, uh, you know, from this um, a new economy that is going to shape the country. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that and I will pass it on back to your moderator. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ramharak. Now, um, some of the comments on the chat was, that was coming up was, okay, if this is the context, this is what the PNC is doing, this is where the PPP is at, what are the solutions, how are people working, how is the government working within the context of what's happening? So you, you, your, your discussion here came in really, really, I think was well placed in terms of giving those projections in terms of possible solutions. So I'll open up now the question and answers and um, I am seeing Mr. Mansraj Ramphal. So Mr. Ramphal, um, please go ahead and ask your question as briefly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as a trained pol political scientist myself, now a budding historian, I understand clearly what Mr. Ravidev has said. He has co correctly identified the problems in Guyana, and mind you, our Trinidad society is very, very similar, and the problems are very, very similar. Um, Dr. Ramharak has put forward very good solutions. Those are the solutions you'll get from some foreign commission coming to take a look when things get worse, right? That six point plan will work for Caribbean societies like Trinidad, like Guyana, and all multi-ethnic societies, which are many in this beautiful world of ours. But as human beings, we have so many um, issues and weapons, psychological, economic, and so on, to fight one another. And it's interesting that we have to now look at, at um, affirmative action, which is a solution I believe um, has to come in Trinidad, particularly in the education field, right? Where one group has long overtaken the other group. There's need for affirmative action for equality in terms of performance. And now to Dr. Tara Singh, I have just two questions. I'm very short, as Madam Chair said we should be. <laughs> so I have two questions for you, Dr. Singh. Every government, every part in the world promises transparency and accountability. 
That is what the PNM came into power in 1956. After just one year in existence, right? There was a corrupt administration and they said transparency and accountability. They won. They didn't have a year's experience. What assurances have you seen in Guyana that this will, this will continue during the next four years of the PPT, PPP's term in office? And then the second question, very brief. You mentioned the major trust in education. What is the percentage of the Guyanese population which is educated at the tertiary level? In okay. Japan, South Korea, and so on, it's above 55%. Um, in Trinidad, when, uh, when figures were produced 10 years ago, it was just seven or eight percent. Okay. All right. So thank you. So Dr. Singh. So um, yeah, yeah. Quickly, I, so two questions. So go ahead. Uh, uh, let me make it clear. Um, my position is to report on the accomplishments. These some accomplishments are well known. They have been done, and there are some projections, works in the progress still, and I was commenting on those. I, I can do an analysis of each separately, but time would not be done. Now, in terms of accountability, I said the government pledged to adhere to transparency and accountability and what they have done. For example, I give an example. For example, the balance at the Bank of Guyana was 68 billion as of June. Compare that to the PNC in the first year, they had a negative balance of 3 billion. Secondly, the PPP, now all political parties, in my view, are involved to some level of corruption. Now, the PP was accused of corruption. The PNC took a lot of them to court. They did over 40 forensic science, and none of them was actually charged or in die, um, sent to jail because of corruption. The evidence was not there. Now, I'm not saying that there is no corruption, but I can just go by what I know and what I heard, and I've been checking into this very carefully because I made my position very clear too. If I know of a case of corruption, I will expose it. And I have written about that. I can't vote what the PP or whatever ministers, but there is corruption. I definitely know the low levels of government in the bureaucracy and that's something. The other question was um, education, the tertiary level. I didn't check at that, but I can tell you education, at the tertiary level in New York, among Indians from Trinidad and Guyana, is 17 out of every 100. Now in Guyana, it's less. Um, I think it's about, but not less than 17%. It's, it's between 10, uh, is, I would say around 15, make a guess, but I'll check on that. But I can tell you, in New York City, where Indians from the Guyana, and trade out of here is 17%. Okay, so thank you. Um, Mr. Ramnarayan Sah Sahadeo, I see you are on the waiting list. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Right, go ahead. Can you direct your question, sir? First, uh, the question is directed to my good friend Ravi Dev, and his answers also uh, for the other on the panel to comment on. Ravi, I'm trying to see if you can translate eloquence into power. Assuming that the role is in government today in Guyana, what would be your approach, party policy in terms of domestic violence, alcohol abuse, the security plans, which you're so detailed and eloquent about, religious conversion, the ethnicity and uh, uh, corruption. Um, I would like to observe that uh, there seems to be an emphasis on economic progress, things that you can calculate. I was wondering if all speakers can comment on a cultural balance sheet, whether we're going backward, forward, or sideways. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Ravide. 
Yeah, um, I think it's a very, very important question. And um, all of us, we have limited time. But what I will say is this, that if our fundamental dilemma in Guyana is based on ethnicity, and since ethnicity is based on your origin and your culture, then there's no question that the answer to our ethnic dilemma will ultimately depend on dealing with the cultural imperative or imperatives. One, for instance, is this, and this is where we in the Caribbean are lucky or unlucky to have been the site of Europe's transition to modernity in which they inculcated racism at the very core of the Western paradigm. Racism is part and parcel of what it is to be modern. And that is why whether you're Japanese or you're French or you're Patagonian, racism is there. So when Indians are blamed for being racial or racist, it's a broader question. And it never surprised me that the PNC 28 year in power and five years in power did not look at the educational curriculum of Guyana or the governments in the Caribbean to look at the, the, the curriculum in the Caribbean as a whole, which is still based on Western notions, for example, there's something that comes from the Bible that is accepted within the Western paradigm, something called a chain of being. That there is God at the very top, then is angels, and then you may have man, and then you have the beast, and then you have the rocks and nature. But man wasn't simply man in man, the white man was on top, followed by other groups, and the black man was at the bottom. So every book, every text that we promulgate is based on that assumption, whether it is Shakespeare with Shylock and his contempt for Jews, or Shakespeare talking about Othello, it, it has to do with that. So I, I, I can't answer all of Ram's question, but to come back to him, if Roe were to get into power, meaning what is the Roe program? And Roe dissolved itself in 2006 because we were not there to seek political power in an ethnic polity like Guyana, which is so evenly divided third parties are not going to exist. It's like a magnetic pole pulling each other. But Beethoven outlined, when he was talking about we, he outlined the role program. And that is the role program, and that is what we would want to put in. Starting with power, the question of power is paramount. And I remember after 1992, I'll close with this, meeting Dr. Jagan after 1992 and advising him that the forces must be balanced and he can start with the presidential guard by make it into a battalion size, trained very heavily. And he asked me, well, Ravi, how, who, how where are we going to get the money to fix the sea walls? We have to focus. Well, we have learned the rest is history, as we say. We must prioritize, and the first thing must be to balance the forces. Okay, so thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Ramara, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, uh, what I said before, right, there are two things in terms of a role program. Um, I, I emphasize the fact about the education and the institutional change when it comes to balancing and, and the education program and so on. But I think what you're going to see in terms of going forward are two issues that is going to be central to the criticism uh, of the PVP. And those two central or dominant issues uh, will be the ethnic factor and it will also be the whole issue about ethnic deprivation. There are Africans today who are talking about the fact that um, they need to go back and look at the village movement and, and in a sense, indirectly saying that some of those land uh, were, were given to Indians. So therefore they have to look at those things. So, so they will make those two arguments. And I think 
if the PPP doesn't address those two issues, and we're saying there are ways you can do it, right? Uh, those institutions can be balanced. <coughs> it was a commission that was set up, I believe in 2004, Mr. Dev can correct me, um, I, and it was adopted by parliament in 2010. Um, I've written a letter to the press recently about this, uh, where uh, David Granger, the leader of the PNC had said that, you know, or had asked the question, how do you balance the force? And I think it was Mr. Dev, uh, who was a presenter said, well, you can do it by establishing targeted outcomes or targeted goals. So you can set a target for one year and then the next year set another target. And over time, you, you should be able to, to do that. Uh, but again, as I said before, my fear as is the PPP themselves, who are the enemies to this kind of approach have made it very clear to me, um, and again, going back to Chetty, uh, uh, you know, uh, God bless his soul, and other current PPP leaders who are unwilling, unwilling to touch this subject, right? And I think the other issue, as I said, that they will make a very dominant um, issue is that Indians are benefiting uh, from the economy, they're corrupt, um, and, and, and it's a cabal, you know, look at the language that they use. And I think that's the second issue that they will go ahead. So my, what I'm saying is that people, P can kind of head that off by having some kind of affirmative action program where you can measure uh, the effect of those programs on different ethnic communities through ethnic impact statements. And, and we have suggested this before. Um, but again, I, I, as I said, I'm not very optimistic because the PPP has that you know, that vision where whatever they do, it's going to benefit. In other words, the ethnic factor is uh, is not a, a major perspective for them. And I think this is where uh, Chetty has left us with that uh, original political sin. Everything should be looked from class. And therefore, whatever the PPP doing, everybody, every race, every class, everybody will benefit. And I think that's part of the tragedy in terms of an ideological perspective. Uh, and, and that's been uh, part of the hindrance in terms of looking at how we can kind of address these issues. Okay, so that's excellent. Now I wanna make reference to um, comments um, on the chat. Um, Ms. Dr. Roseanne Kanhai, she said, um, being aware of PNC, the pattern of their behavior, the narratives that they wrote. So now you, you propose solutions, right? So Ms. Kanhai was asking, how are they working within the psyche of the PNC? How are, if this is the context and this is how they behave, how is the PPP working given that that is the reality? Now you propose solutions, yes, but how much of those solutions are geared towards taking into context, this is how, this is what we're dealing with, this is the reality. Well, you know, like I said, you know, uh, we have to be realistic, right? And, and we know that if you're measuring what the PVP is doing compared to what the PNC has done, you know, it, it, there's a night and day difference, right? So we have to give the PVP that credit. But I right. think one of the, the, the problem, as I said, is how they, uh, they, they have adopted an approach. And that approach is whatever we do will benefit uh, everyone. everyone. But, but there's something else that I think uh, the the PPP has been doing, which I think is very dangerous, uh, which is that you, they try to go out and, and look at African leaders, uh, you know, who work within the African community and in a sense, try to, when I say influence, it does come down to buying off those people. Um, so now, okay, so you can now work on behalf of the PPP, but <clears throat> those people, you know, who would the PPP um, approach to do that uh, in the African community are not seen as legitimate. I mean, look at Sam Hines. He has been vilified by the African community because they don't see him as representing the interests of uh, Africans because he worked on behalf of the PPP. So that is the other approach I think the PPP has adopted. I don't think it's going to work. Um, the best way to address this problem is to be upfront and frank and say, look, we do have an, a race problem. Let's address it. Maybe we can form um, an advisory group that includes Amerindians, Africans, Indians. Um, and maybe they can make recommendations. We can come back to this whole ethnic impact um, mm -hmm. statements we talked about and so on. But but, okay. but like I said, the, the PVP hasn't adopted that kind of approach to the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think to its own detriment. I, I, I think so a some lot of us are agreeing with that. Now, Mr. Well, Gibran, oh, Mr. Dave, go ahead. You have something to add? Yeah, I just want to say this because this comes out of concrete experience being in Guyana that to address Roseanne's question, uh, this is what I had proposed, that 
And the dilemma that Beto said, that no matter what you do, will be vilified by the other side. We should expect that. What I propose to lead on both sides, the PNC and PPP, because when I was in parliament, I was a member of the opposition, and I spoke to both sides. We were a small, minuscule party. Uh, you know, you could talk to everybody. My suggestion to both of these parties is that within your parties, if you don't want people of the other ethnic group to be seen as tokens, form what in America we have as the Black Caucus or the Latino Caucus, and where these people, for example, in the PPP, have the African Guyanese in your party meet separately to discuss issues that concern that constituency. And then they will meet with the party as a whole, just like we have in America, where you have authentic and credible voices and their positions will be credible. But neither party has taken that up. And I made that only as recent as about uh, four years ago uh, and has been taken. Thank okay, you. so that seems even um, more impossible right now, given that the PNC is refusing to even acknowledge that the PPP is a valid party or be, it should be there. So if that if they if they are working on that case, then yeah. you wouldn't want yeah. to be part of a caucus or um, anything like that. Can I make a comment yes. here? Um, if Indians join the PNC, they are regarded as token as well. So it cuts both ways. Um, let me just say something to that. One of the best ways to fight the PNC, we got to get them with facts, correct information. No matter what, the truth and facts will triumph in the end. That is my um, position. Now, when the PNC was in power, most of the people who get contracts and who did exception were, were Indians. They had a chance to appoint their own people, employ them, but they choose. Over 20 something Indians benefited. We know how they are. The Sussexry Bond, where a man was paid millions and millions of us in a house, a store, um, just a few condoms and, and lubricants and these things. So um, the, the thing is that whenever we discuss this, is to talk at the theoretical level, we also got to go to the practical level mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. works. Racism is a very difficult issue. It cannot be done by just throwing up a few ideas. Right. I, I, I recall that there's a guy, an American professor, was interviewing a friend of mine on, on racism. And he said, do you have anything against the other race, including black? He said, no, um, I communicate with all of them. He said, OK, would you agree for your daughter to marry an African? The guy said, well, that is a different question. So I see it's, it's listen, and I disagree with the previous speaker. Racism didn't start by colonialism. It exacerbated racism was there since the beginning of history. Racism was there. It was just exacerbated through colonial um, exploitation, etc. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now, Mr. Gibran on the chat, he put up two issues. He spoke about security needs to be developed. And so we've already discussed that. And I think that this will continue to work at the detriment, as all of us um, saw. Now, Mr. Gibran, it should be discussion, sir. He also talked about racial harmony. And, and I wouldn't throw this out to the, the panelists, but generally, if you think about racism, racism is based on how we are cultured. So in order to, to deal with racism as an issue and racial harmony, I think that will take generations of reculturing the psyches of people. But who's going to start doing that? So that's a whole different discussion there altogether, right? Now, Shalima Mohammed also put up a very, very important comment. She says that imp ethnic impact statements should be applied to Trinidad and that a foreign objective body should do it. So I, I, I did not even know that this was something that, and I think it's a brilliant thing, but then it's who has the authority to ask for it? The government, the, the opposition, so that's a good question. Can anybody um, share, um, Mr. Amarak, who has the authority to, to request um, an ethnic impact assessment? 
Well, I mean, uh, this is something the government can do, right? Because the government right. is in power, you know, they have the authority, they can do it. Mm -hmm. um, because you have the, the, the accusation is coming from, from the outside, mm -hmm. you know, from the opposition. And if this is um, a cry, a battle cry, you know, that they have, and they will continue to do it, then why not, as I said, address it? They can propose that they can propose what you know what Mr. Dev is saying about having a caucus, you know, which is very common in the U.S. Congress, uh, which will include not just Africans and Indians but also Amerindians. And I think so that has to come from that approach. Um, and but but like I, as I keep saying, uh, I'm not optimistic that this government will do it. Um, but there is a, there is a necessity. And I think that pressure, if the government is not willing to do it, it has to come from Indians. Your audience here is primarily Indians. And the question ought to be asked is, are we going to be better off if this government leaves office and do not win the next election or when the next round of street fight um, occur in Georgetown as the um, PNC begins to consolidate its force and address its internal problem, are we going to be much safer? Um, you know, when that, um, you know, should that happen? So, so, so the question is, that pressure has to come from supporters of the PPP also to put the onus on them that, hey, you're there, we, we voted you in office, so therefore, why not, you know, address these issues and create these institutions that right. we have been talking okay. about? Okay, so lovely. Uh, didn't you may I say something? Um, who is that? I'm not... Mr. Dev? Oh, okay, Mr. Dev, go ahead. So, sure. Yeah, um, well, that question, in fact, the ethnic impact statement was proposed by me on behalf of Grower back in 1998 after the Indians were beaten. So it goes, it has a long uh, history. But as recent uh, in Guyana, after 1998, an ethnic relations uh, commission was formed and it has 24 uh, parts to its mandate. And within that mandate, they can issue, they can compile and issue ethnic impact uh, statements. And when I made a presentation on behalf of Indians in December, 2020, I reminded them of that, but. Nothing has happened up to now. Okay. All They're right. an independent body and they can go ahead and do it if they right. so uh, want. Okay. Okay. So thank you. Lovely. Um, Vasan, I'm not seeing you with your hand up, though. I, I, I... Unmute. Unmute, Vasan. <laughs> your, your mic is off. Why am I not seeing you? He's there. Okay. You can, can only have your hand up if you have. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Go you. ahead. Yes, thanks for this opportunity. Um, listen, we got to be honest and we got to be bold in what we say. First, to begin, you, there is no society where you're going to wipe out, wipe out racism. And if you want to define racism, a race want to marry their own kind, I mean, that is not racism. But let's talk about Guyana. Given the history of Guyana and as Dr. Tara Singh say, too many times Indians come together with, with black leadership and they fail us. It is time to prepare Indians' mind to think that Guyana has to be petitioned. It cannot work no other way. And Guyana is a huge country. I agree. Each region have a lot of resources of its own. Guyana has to move towards petition. Okay, there's so thank no you. Love, hold on. There is, no, uh -huh. there is no love story again for Guyana. You all have to be honest. You have okay, to be so honest about let what me, you're saying. Vasan, are you talking about partition as it with India and Pakistan? Yes, you have to split Guyana. Yeah, but look at what happened to Pakistan and region. India. It just it just created you have historical to be honest. All right, you can't what? I that to me sounds like festering further hate no, and racism. No, no, no. I completely be disagree honest. with you. Be honest. Listen. Okay, hear, hear me out for a minute. Hear me out for a minute. Blacks consider, you have to be honest, Blacks consider Guyana Diaz, cool. Indians on expired contract, expired visa. 
the black people are telling you they don't care for election no more. Dr. Right. David Hines, Osingi, Eric Phillips, all these people are saying to you, we don't care for election no more. Okay, Be honest. But yes, and we, if we you take in Indians down this road, let me finish, no, please. No, but let me finish, please. Let me finish, good. please. So go if ahead, finish you up, keep please. having Indian on the mindset federalism and one love and let's come together no start preparing their mind and by the way in this global community black people can't do a shit to you yes they have some guns but but their measurement of power they can't do a shit what are they going to do shoot an indian here and there they can't go prepare the indian minds on splitting guyana Okay, so I hope when you say something like that, the person being shot is not somebody who is near and dear to you, sir. Right? So that's that's. Can that's I say something, please? No, I, I miss what you say. Oh, no. okay, okay. I see. Um, let's uh, give uh, Daniel wants to speak, and then we'll close yes. uh, with <clears throat> Ram Narayan and Bitu Ram, and the program will come to an end. Thank you. Um, I think Mr. Vasant or Vasant should not be dismissed outright. I think he is making a very valid and to some extent realistic observation. Um, but I want to prefer two things here. Um, one, I believe Ravidev is eminently qualified to speak about racial harmony in Guyana. And I was hoping that he would have um, express himself a little more on that issue as you know he is singularly qualified to do so having lived and visited practically every nook and cranny of Guyana and he's very familiar with the different groups he also grew up among black people like myself um, I had the fortune of attending um, Blankenburg Congregational School in Denamstel and then I'm still is the equivalent of Buxton. So I, I, and I went to high school with a lot of black people also. Right. I know these folks very well. I grew up with them. Um, I have a lot of respect for, uh, for my teachers, um, you know, who were all blacks. Um, but I think um, Ravidev knows much more than I do on this issue. But if, if I may go back very quickly to what Vasant is saying. Vasant, the easiest way for this partition to be, to be realized is for Maduro, and I, wrote, uh, and I wrote on this, is for Maduro to truncate this country and the Indians just move, move over to the Vuna de Reclamacion, and that's the end of the story. Simple as that. Okay. All right, so thank yeah, you. Let me, um, can I, I, I just, just I know, where would the Amerindians go when you do that? Yeah, yeah. Well, they can choose. <laughs> oh, right, right, that sounds bad. You tell, so the when logistics you could work out after yeah. well, prepare the Indian mind for it, logistics yeah. will work out after. <laughs> yeah, let, let me just, uh, can I just say, thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I think um, in defense of what Vasan is saying, um, you know, it's not an unusual idea, but I think when Indians hear that, it's somehow the antennas go up and they shake in their pants. So let me just say that the whole notion of partition uh, is one conflict resolution option that people yeah. have you know we've got let me just finish you've got yeah. countries like you know yugoslavia you know for a war you know they, they're broken up into seven countries it's not a novel idea when it comes to guyana uh, in fact blacks have been very bold you see guyana has has talked about this whole no notion of partition in a different form but the idea was there um, eric phillips uh, is also uh, someone who's proposing this plan. So, so I, I think it can be ruled out completely. It's something that ought to be factored in, in our solution, in our you know, um, desire to find a solution. But I do want to make, I want to say something, and I think this is the first time I'm seeing this in a public audience. Um, 
Indians, it's not unusual for Indians to actually go out and decide to change situations when it comes to using radical means. Uh, in 1982, uh, when, you know, when Barnum was in, in power, there was a group of Guyanese led by a guy named Sridhar Lakhan, um, who they formed an organization called the Conservative Party of Guyana. And they actually went out um, and they I bought weapons, the right? Um, and they had hid those weapons uh, in furniture. And the idea was to take those things to Guyana to remove the Barnum government. Now, who condemned them? Obviously, they were caught, you know, by Secret Service agents here. But the, obviously, Barnum definitely condemned them. But the PPP, a revolutionary Marxist party, also condemned them. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that what I'm saying is these are options that are there. And because Guyanese may not be aware of those things, um, it, it ought to be factored into our whole equation. Because if you continue to have violence uh, in Guyana, then we have to find ways uh, to deal with you know, with those issues. Um, it, it may be novel for us in Guyana, but, but the point is uh, having a discussion about these things, um, you know, um, should not be excluded. Okay, great. Now, um, the partition idea, it's, it's all, I'm glad that you brought it up and you made reference to other parts of the world that is happening. And, uh, you know, it's so scary what has happened historically when these kind of divisions happen. So that's so I guess I'm looking at it in an idealistic way in terms of not, not being divisive, right? But I guess that's the bigger on the, the, the topic here. Divisiveness or unity, but then which one is really attainable? So now we're going on, um, to move on. Um, let's see, Mike Pistan. Hello, everyone. Um... I want to take up one sentence from uh, Mr. Dev. Dev said the PNC is determined to keep the P PVP out of power. Before 1992, that was their determination. After 1992, that is still their determination. How do we deal with this question? And this is um, an Indian versus black struggle for power. If that is a determination for one side um, and they have control of the state, the, the, the word, the phrase deep state um, is best uh, illustrated uh, with the situation in Guyana. The blacks control all organs of the state. So, if they haven't given up, how do we deal with that? I think in this context, Vasan makes a lot of sense. If that is what is going to, one side is going to do, you have to prepare, find some alternative, not to pretend that we don't have a problem in the society. We do have a big, big problem. The whole society, this whole place could blow up one day, like Syria or some other place. So I have a different um, proposal here, and um, we should ask the United States uh, to come in and help us. They are a power. We have a problem in this country that Blacks and Indians on their own, by themselves, cannot solve this problem. I know Dev has been coming up with a whole basket of solutions. Uh, you got to give Dev a lot of credit federalism, uh, now he's come up with a whole set of new ideas. Uh, he's a thinker, but I don't think these things have any chance to succeed. Therefore, we need a federal power to come in to save us. We can't bring in um, Pompeo to save us every time. We need a long-term permanent solution. Let us begin to debate the idea of forming a or proposing, asking the United States to take us in as a state, a federal state with equal rights of a state to form a union, to join the union with the United States. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. So we're getting a lot of options in here. Now we, we're having people proposing partitions, we're having um, ethical past statements. Um, now we are looking for foreign um, subvention, um, basically in a way to come and oversee 
Um, so that's so we get the ideas for solutions. So Mr. Ramahat, I'll invite you to close um, to finish up with your whatever you have to say, and then we'll close up. Oh, well, um, you know, I, I will just repeat what I said earlier, uh, which is that it's one thing to say that we have, you know, we have all of these accomplishments and the other side don't recognize these achievements and therefore they're just misbehaving their children. Um, we have to address the problem uh, and address it frontally. And I think the, the central um, issue in Guyana is this whole notion of um, ethnicity, race and ethnicity. Um, if the PPP doesn't address it, um, it's going to be a problem for their own supporters, as we've seen in the past. They have to create institutions, they have to balance the armed force, they have to, you know, um, we talk about the ethnic impact statement, all of those things that we mentioned, I think those things have to become a reality uh, because I think it's much more now because I think there are many in the P PPP uh, you know, who really believe that with the oil wealth that's coming, uh, all of these economic problems as the country become economically uh, developed, you know, those social political issues will disappear because everybody will be happy because, they, 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 you know, they'll all be wealthy. That's not going to be the case, as we have seen, you know, from what the opposition is doing. So, so in a sense, we are our own enemies if we can't recognize the fact that we need to address these issues frontally. Uh, and when you do that, you're being honest and you can address the issue that the opposition uh, is pushing and you can address the issue uh, for okay. your own supporters also. And I think that's the way to go. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sahel, I'll give you one minute, sir. Because I've seen that you hand up. Go ahead. Yes, th thank you. I think um, with respect to most multicultural societies, education does help. Um, but in uh, Guyana and most of the Caribbean, I think we need to learn more about ourselves and others. And that is why I think uh, the invitation by CXC for submissions as to what they're going to include in their next history program uh, is an opportunity for people to comment. I have my email there. But lastly, with respect to Mike Prasad's suggestion, I would like uh, people to know that Canada is more appropriate because we were trying to work out a relationship with St. Kitts and Nevis. So we have a better relationship with races in Canada, though not perfect. Thank you very much. Um, okay, if so I may add a quick, uh, Bindu, if I may add a quick rejoinder. Uh, when okay. I when I suggest the United States, I meant to say either the United States or Canada. But okay. we need a, a strong federal power to come in to help us. Thank you. Okay, so you meant North American assistance. Great. All right. So everybody, thank you very much. Now you realize that this will always be a heated discussion given the heatedness of what happens in Guyana historically. What I think is really missing from here is it, um, the presence of the, the government ministers or some sort of relaying of discourses like this or their involvement in discourses like this. But there's, um, there's, we are playing our part as a diaspora, bringing up issues and talking about um, problems and different things that we are facing um, in the diaspora community. So thank you all, everyone, for your presence here this afternoon and tonight. I would like to thank all our new audience members, as well as those who are here religiously. We appreciate your loyalty and your support. And we look forward to your participation and whatever contributions you have to make in the future. I would like to thank all our contributors, our participants, and let me so I don't want to make I don't want to leave anybody out here. I want to make sure I, I acknowledge who I am supposed to. So let me just open up back my document. Um, we. Look forward again to your presence next week. Remember, our start time is at three o'clock now consistently, so it's not going to be modified well until any other um, issues may arise. And I would like to thank all of you for the taking the time to participate, especially the presenters. Thanks to the advisory and planning team led by Dr. Kumar Mahir. This is a team effort directed by the people 
of the Indian diaspora, Dr. Tara Singh from New York, Brian Ram Paul from California, Chris Kaswaj from Florida, Cliff Rajkumar from Canada, Jai Sez from Grenada, and Shalima Mohammed and Sasa Deo from Trinidad, Leon Bullings and Deo Sharman from Suriname, and many, many others. I also am not forgetting our IT manager behind the scene, Ravi Ramsing, who has been recording the program and will edit and upload it to our website and to YouTube permanently, permanently for posterity. As I said, this is a public meeting. It is being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. Feel free to contact ICC, as you would have seen Dr. Kumar placing on the chat with information to publish your books, magazines, and reports. Send us your email addresses and WhatsApp number so we can build our database and send out our invitations to you. Our tentative topic next week is the aftermath of attacks. No, it's not tentative. Our topic next week is the aftermath of attacks against Indians and minorities in South Africa. Please like, share, and follow our Facebook page. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Be safe and enjoy the rest of your day and night, depending on the time zone. I am Bindu Maharaj from Trinidad, saying take care until next Sunday, same time, same virtual space. Goodbye. May God bless you all. Dhaniyabad. <laughs>